Good morning, ladies. This is our second week talking about wisdom. Um, and, and, you know, wisdom is something that we can kind of di- differentiate, I guess, between common sense and wisdom. Common sense, my dad used to call it horse sense, um, is something that is everybody has it to some degree. I mean, it's just, that's why they say it's common. It's common to all men. God graciously gives people, uh, another way to call it is walking around sense, how to navigate life. Uh, but it's very limited. It's, it isn't the, um, the kind of sense or knowledge or understanding that is communicated when we say wisdom. So what we're talking about today is wisdom from God, godly wisdom, biblical wisdom, um, as opposed to worldly wisdom, because there is such a thing as worldly wisdom too. But we'll be exploring that as we um, begin in Proverbs chapter 1. But before we get there, I want to just mention that, you know, God speaks to us in the Bible in a lot of different ways. Uh, Sometimes it's through direct commands and laws. Um, The prophets give us a lot of warnings. Uh, Jesus teaches through parables. Uh, The the history books teach us through real life stories and, and then also through the beauty of the Psalms. But what happens when you're in a situation that the Bible doesn't directly address? <clears throat> For instance, there's nowhere in the Bible that tells you which house to buy or which job offer to accept or how to help your teenage granddaughter through the dramas of high school. We need wisdom. Wisdom is very practical knowledge. Here's an example of wisdom uh, in a verse in Proverbs 27 Uh, verse 14, that is extremely uh, practical. It says, a loud and cheerful greeting early in the morning will be taken as a curse. Isn't that hysterical? But it's also very true that um, we need to have the wisdom to know when to reach out to somebody and, you know, be be smart about how you, um, how you would greet someone. Or how about this one? It's better to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Uh Uh-oh, that's not in Proverbs. I think Mark Twain said that. Although there is a verse in Proverbs that says, When words are many, sin is not absent. Now that one really challenges me because I'm a woman with a lot of words. And uh, the more I use words, sometimes I get in trouble. Um, But there's another valuable gift that comes with wisdom. Suppose you knew all of the rules and commands, but you had a snarky, ugly attitude about it. Well, wisdom to the rescue. Proverbs 4, 9 says that wisdom will bestow on you a beautiful crown. Wise Christians are attractive. Colossians 4, verse 5 reminds us to walk in wisdom toward outsiders. You know, those that don't yet believe. When we live according to beautiful wisdom, more people will want to know where we got it. But let's not think of the Proverbs as quick fixes or, uh, or to make it fit every situation. It's more about the long view. It's the idea of soaking in the Proverbs over a long period of time, years, and beginning to realize at some point that huh, God's helping me think better. He's helping me respond to life better. You know, there's a verse in Second Chronicles chapter 20 where uh, the king, Jehoshaphat, I think, um, was in a, a very difficult predicament. And he says in this verse 12, Lord, we do not know what to do, but... Our eyes are on you. You know, sometimes the right right path to take just isn't glowing like a neon sign that says, turn here. So we acknowledge that we don't have a clue, and we put our eyes on God, and we wait. So let's get started in Proverbs 1, 
verses 1 through 7. The purpose of Proverbs and of wisdom starts right here in verse 2. Now, the verse 1 is going to tell us um, who wrote Proverbs. And it clearly states that Solomon is the author. Um, But when you begin reading the entire book, you'll see that he included writings of other uh, wise people as well, starting maybe at chapter 20. All right, so the purpose of Proverbs and Wisdom is stated beginning here in verse 2. To know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth, to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Oh, did I skip verse 6? To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. Okay, now let's start at verse 2. So here we are looking at the purpose of wisdom is to know wisdom and instruction. Here's where Solomon states the purpose of wisdom. We could also call it deep character or a skill or expertise or competence that understands how life really works and with successful and beautiful results. This word wisdom in Hebrew is used in Exodus when God gave Moses instructions for designing and building the temple. From the goldsmiths who fashioned the articles for worship to the beautiful ones who wove the tapestries on the draped walls, God was giving these artisans beautiful wisdom in order to create something that would lead us to worship. Okay, so he says... Um, wis- to know wisdom, and then he says instruction. But that word instruction can also be translated discipline. And, you know, we kind of cringe when we heard, hear the word discipline, because who, who likes discipline? Um, but, you know, we're not born with this beautiful wisdom, and so discipline is often necessary. So uh, God corrects us. As we soak in what we read in, in God's Word, we sometimes it takes some trial and error to make it sit, stick or to make us totally apply what we're learning. I mean, I mean, really, who of us is totally surrendered to God's ways 100% of the time? So sometimes He has to work with us a bit to get His wisdom worked into us. All right, the next thing he says in wisdom is in order to understand words of insight. And words of insight could also be translated straight thinking. I, I, would, be, I would like to call that biblical thinking. Most Christians who spend a lot of time in God's Word begin to develop biblical thinking about everything in life. We sometimes call this a biblical worldview. Um, Everything from raising children to international politics are going to be affected from from the time that we've spent in the Bible for the person who has been indwelled by the Holy Spirit in their new birth. So biblical thinking is the opposite of worldly thinking. And we're going to see that. we're, We're seeing it in our world. If you haven't been paying attention, then this may not make a bit of sense to you. But as, as I watch the culture drifting, I mean, like a hard direction towards worldly values, a hard shift towards um, a, a very carnal and um, self-oriented direction, that is the opposite of biblical thinking. It is not a biblical worldview to, um, to think the way so many in our world today are thinking and doing life. 
they're doing life according to anything other than the Bible. And so we read Proverbs to understand this straight thinking, to understand and to begin to soak up and develop a biblical worldview. All right, and verse 3 says um, that Proverbs was, was given to, in order to receive instruction in wise dealing in righteousness, justice, and equity. Now, we could go spend a lot of time talking about these particular things um, like righteousness, justice, and equity, but I want to point out where he says at the beginning to receive instruction. Receiving instruction is tough. Um, another way to look at it is to say being teachable. But uh, receiving requires meekness. It requires humility, doesn't it? It requires that we're not like a know-it-all and think that there's nothing else that you can teach me. James 1.21 begs us to receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Receive with meekness the implanted word. God is planting his word in our hearts. Will we receive it and accept it as being his very words, the voice of God, and allow it to save our souls? That is an important really, really important thing for all of us to kind of noodle on. Or am I teachable? Am I willing to receive? Am I receiving God's word with meekness? Another purpose here explained in verse 4 is in order to receive prudence to the simple knowledge and discretion to the youth. Um, as we think about the book of Proverbs and the wisdom that it provides, it's telling us it will give us prudence, or it'll give the simple or the, the uneducated in the, in the ways of God, it'll give them prudence. Now, prudence is a really old-fashioned word. Um, prudence could m maybe be thought of as skill or even savvy. Um, even just really uh, an ability to look at a situation and navigate it in a way that is street smart. Um, it doesn't necessarily limit itself to, you know, being able to put the, the Bible into a spiritual context, but to take the spiritual context and apply it to a, um, a worldly con context. So to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Uh, I don't know about you, but, but I wish I had done more of this when I was the mother of children that were young, when they were very young. Now, we did, you know, have them reading the book of Proverbs when they were very young. But I ran into a friend who just it made me really think I wish I'd thought of this when my kids were little she was so she was a single mother and so she had a huge responsibility with three daughters and um, she would sit down with her three daughters and then we're looking back to the 90s after she got home from work she would sit down with her three girls who were I would imagine she was those girls were somewhere around 10 to 14 or 15. Um, and she would sit down with them after she got home from work, and they would watch like a late afternoon sitcom on TV. And they would, um, they would mute the sound um, when the uh, commercial came on, and the mother would ask the daughters, okay, now tell me what just happened in that last segment. Tell me what happened in that segment that was good and kind and gentle and loving, and tell me what in it was mean-spirited or was an obvious sin. And 
she began to teach her children, her these young girls, how to think uh, critically and how, but how to think biblically, how to have discretion. And then sometimes she said that they would, um, they would look at a commercial and she would say, now tell me if you think this commercial is telling the truth and tell me if you think this product can be trusted. Tell me if you think that you can, you can trust what they say, what they are telling you as to be authoritative and true and that you could spend your money on what they're trying to sell. And I'm thinking, I wish I had thought of doing that with my kids because these girls were being taught discretion and wisdom. And I wonder if parents take the time to do that or even think about doing that. Moving on to verse five, uh, we see the the uh, next, now it's still talking about purpose, but it's not uh, doing the, uh, in order to give, in order to receive, in order to understand, all of those. This one's a little bit of a shift. It says, let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. So it sounds like Solomon is now addressing those of us who already are wise to become wiser still. In other words, don't stop growing even when you're old. Don't think you've learned it all and couldn't still grow in wisdom and knowledge and maybe even be willing to learn a new skill. I know this is difficult for me. At my age, I'm, I'm getting to be the, um, a little resistant to learning something new on the computer. Re this last week, there was a, um, w we got a, um, an email from the organization we work for, Crew, um, asking us to download this app on our computer that will help us navigate the, the website, uh, the Crew website, better for those of us who are staff members. And I resisted so much because it was a complicated thing and I didn't want to learn something new. And I, I griped and grumbled and, you know, fussed about it with John. Um, but it's, th that's just a, a minor example, a worldly example of those kinds of real life things that we deal with. And f from a spiritual perspective, God is saying, Vicki, don't shrivel up. You know, don't be rebellious. Don't resist. You know, the, 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 the people you work for, they're an authority over you. So humble yourself and do what they've asked you to do. Don't be a, re a rebel. And so um, being teachable, even as we think we are old enough to be teaching, is something that Proverbs is urging us to do. Verse 6, again, gives us the purpose of this growing um, that we're talking about in verse 5, because the this, this sentence continues. Let me start back at verse 5 and read the entire thing. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the, wonder, the one who understands obtain guidance to understand a proverb and a saying and the words of the wise and their riddles. <coughs> Excuse me. So the, the, the purpose of me continuing to grow in wisdom is in order that I would be able to understand these proverbs in the Bible and the sayings and the riddles and the things that I need to read and study in order to write a lesson. And so I thought, well, wonder what it would be like to be a fly on the wall in a gathering of really wise and godly women, men and women of the past. You know, I, I think of Elizabeth Elliot or Amy Carmichael or C.S. Lewis, and I'm not going back very far <coughs> when I mention these names, but these are people that had a lot to say about 
wise living. And, you know, sometimes they'll say something, especially C.S. Lewis, will, will say something in a book, and I'm like, I don't get that. That, uh, um, that's hard. And the thing about being teachable is that I am now more and more willing to sit in that teaching and just noodle on it. Just ask God, okay, expand my comprehension. Give me spiritual insight into what this man is saying. Or, or to something that Elizabeth Elliot wrote, you know, 40, 50 years ago, that I need to apply that in my life. Help me to have that kind of insight uh, that she is trying to share with me. You know, and I, as I prepare lessons each week, I do a lot of reading uh, of people like that, and also even older things, two, three, four hundred year old commentaries, and. It's so difficult for my brain to comprehend what they're saying because honestly, I think our brains have shriveled, not because of age. I think it has nothing to do with age. I think our brains have shriveled because of these screens. Everything from the one we hold in our hand and the one that sits on our desk and the one that's in our car, the dashboard of our car, we have screens in front of our faces all the time. And so we've become kind of dumb, dumbed down by being in front of screens. And you would say, well, wait, that's where all the information is. Um, Information, yes. Wisdom, no. An ability to think, no. We can Google and get bites, sound bites, and bits of information at our fingertips, but do we know what to do with that information? Do we know how to process it? It just is, we're finding, and, and all the sociologists and all the um, scientific thinkers are discovering that our brains are not able to think like they used to. I even think about some stuff that um, I learned in high school and college that to, if I were to have to go read that again today, I'm not sure I would comprehend it as quickly as I did back then. And I'm not sure it's my age. I think it's probably... Um, something that could be blamed on the screens. And so um, even vocabulary words that I once could read and understand, those words are not used anymore. So I have to stop and look up a word that I at one time knew what that meant. Um, it's, It's really amazing how simplistic vocabulary is now. And so if we will spend time soaking and marinating in God's Word, our brains will be stretched. Our brains will be exercised. And um, I did read one thing that was very intriguing to me on this topic. Um, this was from a scientist who said that, and, and I'm, I'm assuming she's a believer because she said, reading the Bible literally remaps the brain. Isn't that interesting? Um, there's, and there are verses in the Bible that talk to us about how our minds can be um, made, can be strengthened through reading God's Word. So I really encourage you to, to make this a focus of your day, to spend some time in God's Word in order to improve your your brain, your thinking ability. Then finally, we get to the seventh verse that is so interesting. 
it's it's like if the the verses we've read so far are the purpose of this journey into wisdom verse 7 is the first step of the journey it all begins right here what is it it says the fear of the lord is the beginning of knowledge or wisdom depending on which translation you have so what does it mean to fear the lord well, hold that thought because I want to I want to consider the second part, which will explain as we as we explain the second part of this couplet, we will realize what the fear of the Lord actually is. This the second part of the second line of the couplet is fools despise wisdom and instruction. That word despise, I mean I I even have been asking in the last two um, groups, when is the last time you actually used the word despise? It's a word that's packed with emotion. It's a word of contempt. You know, it would be one thing to say, I despise liver. But if, if the word despise is used to say, I despise wisdom, I despise instruction, it's a word of contempt and relational aloofness. It's one who is arrogant and above instruction. It's one who's too smart, too good, too busy to mess with this stuff. And who did Solomon say has this terrible attitude? Fools. That's what he calls them, fools. And, and wait just a minute, before you get the wrong impression of what a fool is, a fool can be a very intelligent person and have advanced degrees from the best universities. But he's a fool because he feels no need for God or for moral cleansing or for help of any kind. This person would walk away if a pastor spoke of personal sin. But the person who fears the Lord is open to God. She is eager to please him, humble enough to be taught by him. The woman who fears the Lord is willing to change, to surrender to his written word, to obey. I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. It clearly contrasts the um, perspective of humility that comes from the fear of the Lord against the person, the perspective of the fool who has no desire for God or for wisdom. C.S. Lewis says, in God you come up against something which is in every respect immeasurably superior to yourself. Unless you know God as that, and therefore know yourself as nothing in comparison. You don't know God at all. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. Isn't that true? And so we don't want to be the fool who despises wisdom because it's, it's, a, it's a despising of God and all God has to say. Instead, we want to have that appropriate view of who God is and who we are in relation to God. Now let's see where wisdom is found. Isaiah 11, 1 through 3 says, A shoot will come from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel, of might. The spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Do you know who this is? Um, Isaiah is prophesying about? Jesus Christ. And he's saying that Jesus will have a spirit of wisdom and understanding, that Jesus will have a spirit of counsel and of might. 
Jesus will have the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord and will delight in the fear of the Lord. You know, um, I love this one. The, the spirit of counsel is, um, is so good because we spend a lot of money going to a really good counselor. And there is no better counselor than Jesus Christ. And so that is who we need to be looking to for the wisdom that God offers as we navigate life and complicated lives at that. Luke 2, 52 says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. You realize he's only 12 years old when this is stated, that he was increasing in wisdom as a 12-year-old. I love that because it speaks of his humanity as well as his deity. <clears throat> now, here's where we're going to end with just a few verses. There are two kinds of people, and we saw that in the, the last verse we read in Proverbs. We've got the one who seeks wisdom and the one who rejects wisdom. Um, so Matthew 7 very clearly expresses those two kinds of people. This is the last, uh, last little section of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus has been teaching the people. And Jesus said, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And then everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. These, this is such a clear contrast of the wise person and the foolish person. It tells us, Jesus says, the wise person is the one who hears these words of mine and obeys them. That is the foundation that causes the house to stand in the storms, in the hurricanes, in the floods, in the, the, the things that life throws at us. This house stands because the foundation of the house is built on a biblical worldview. That person has heard the words of Jesus and has obeyed the words of Jesus. By contrast, Jesus says the, the ones who don't obey those words, they hear them, but they don't obey them. They've heard and read the words of God, but they've rejected the words of God. That person is a foolish, foolish person because they build their house, they're building their life on a foundation that is sinking sand and it will not survive. Mark 8, 33 in closing says, and this is speaking of Jesus and the disciples, but Jesus turned, looked at his disciples and he re rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God but on the things of man. Now, let me just back up to tell you what he's, why he's so upset with Peter. <clears throat> Peter had this wonderful revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And God, Jesus says, way to go, Peter, but you didn't think that up on your own. The Holy Spirit revealed it to you. And then Peter, a little bit later, says, I know, I know, I know that you are going to become the king and that you are the Messiah and all of that. But do you really have to do a cross? I mean, really, isn't there another way? Can't we skip that part and go right into the kingdom part where everything is wonderful and everything is restored? And I like that 
I like that end part. I just don't like what you're telling me that we've got to go through to get to that. Boy, Jesus turned on Peter, got right in his face, and said, Get behind me, Satan. Whoa. That is a harsh rebuke. Jesus goes on and he says, You're not setting your mind on the things of God but on the things of man. In other words, you're a fool. You're thinking like a fool. You are not thinking biblically. You're not you're hearing what I'm saying, but you're rejecting it. You don't like it. You're looking for a a, a better alternative, and there is no other route to eternal life but through the cross. We must go through the cross in order to have eternal life. And so the fool refuses to go that route. No, tell me another path. Uh, All roads lead to heaven, right? I'm going to choose a different path. I don't want the path of the cross. That person is a fool. That person thinks worldly thoughts not biblical thoughts. Ladies, that's what we, what I desire for each one of us is that we embrace the wisdom that God is offering us through his word. And by embrace, I mean, take it to heart. Obey it. Value the words of God over the words of the culture. Because the words of the culture are going to lie to you just as regularly as the commercials on the television. It will lie to you. Trust God and His Word. His ways are best. His ways lead to life, eternal life, forever and ever with God. Thanks for listening, girls.